Welcome to the section on schizophrenia and other related disorders. Now, schizophrenia is arguably the most disabling psychiatric disorder in existence, and it trumps almost all medical disorders besides quadriplegia or advanced dementia by some metrics. As per usual, the focus of this talk will be on distinguishing schizophrenia from other similar disorders, and on addressing the clinical decisions that you'll be faced with on step one and in real life. Schizophrenia is the quintessential psychotic disorder and by necessity requires the presence of psychosis for its diagnosis. Y'all remember the definition of psychosis, right? Psychosis is defined as having either hallucinations, delusions, which are fixed false beliefs, and disorganization. Basically, words or actions that suggest a patient can't process things in a logical linear manner like you or me. Well, at least like me. They may fly wildly off topic when you talk to them, respond to you by repeating the last thing you said, or simply by saying words that rhyme. There's a whole list of formally described examples of disorganization that you can look up if you're interested, but it'll usually be pretty apparent on step one. Now, like I said, the diagnosis of schizophrenia requires that there be at least one symptom of psychosis, and in the parlance of schizophrenia, these are actually referred to as positive symptoms. But seemingly for no other reason than to make your life harder, psychiatrists decided to subdivide disorganized speech and disorganized behavior when defining schizophrenia. You'll see why that's important in a moment. Now, in addition to overt psychosis, the negative symptoms of schizophrenia are a common trait in the disease. Negative symptoms are distinct from the previous four positive symptoms in that instead of involving the presence of abnormal perception, thought, and action, they're actually deficits in things that people normally do. Schizophrenic patients may emote less, be less motivated, speak less, and be less expressive. Now, these symptoms are thought to be mediated by a different neural pathway than the positive symptoms because while our drugs work pretty darn well on the positive symptoms, they don't really do a lot for the negative symptoms. Furthermore, patients with predominantly negative symptoms tend to have worse prognoses. These guys generally never become fully functional. Now this brings us to the second rule of schizophrenia. In addition to a classically psychotic symptom, you need a total of two or more of the positive and negative symptoms combined in order to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. The negative symptoms and disorganized behavior act almost like minor criteria in that they're not considered cornerstone traits of schizophrenia, but they do contribute to the diagnosis. Finally, while cognitive impairment is not a factor in the diagnosis of schizophrenia, it is increasingly being recognized as an important part of why this disease is so disabling. Completely apart from the positive and negative symptoms, these patients develop intellectual and learning-related deficits that put most schizophrenic patients around one or two standard deviations below the general population. Addressing these issues with occupational counseling and special ed is starting to become a very important part of managing the patients with schizophrenia and increasing their ability to adapt to their environment. Now that covers the three main features of schizophrenia, but where people mess up on step one is the timing. And to highlight this point, I'm going to go over the natural history of schizophrenia right here. Now, it doesn't always work like this, but this is kind of the classic course that schizophrenia takes. Your typical vignette will start off with a 20-year-old guy in college, or a 30-year-old lady at a new job, full of potential, who starts to get a little... Mm, off. They may start acting strangely, performing poorly at work, maybe picking up a new religion that's actually a cult. But at a certain point, the decline of function becomes a full-on psychotic break, during which their daily functioning is severely impaired. Eventually, the episode ends, but their baseline function actually doesn't return to normal. And in fact, after every psychotic break, you see a progressive decrease in baseline functioning. During the period between the psychotic breaks, the negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms generally predominate, and this is mainly what causes the progressive decline between episodes. Now, why am I telling you this? It's not because I like the sound of my own voice, which, by the way, is as beautiful as it is captivating. One of the main things that distinguishes the psychotic disorders is the elapsed time. Schizophrenia, for example, requires that the behavior last at least six months, but that's six months from the time that it started, not necessarily six straight months of frank psychosis. Remember, the first psychotic episode is usually preceded by the prodrome, during which the patient may not necessarily meet the diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia, but this time counts. The reason this is important is, the patient will usually present during the acute psychotic phase. For example, their friends will bring the patient in and say, Hey, about two days ago, Sally Sue started peeing on the furniture and yelling something about Satan's grandson. It's only after you ask them that they'll tell you, Oh yeah, I guess she has been acting a little strange for the last year. So it's important. Now, I'm not normally such a stickler about specific criteria, but I am a stickler about differential diagnoses. Most of the psychotic disorders are classified by duration. A psychotic disorder lasting six months or longer is schizophrenia, like I just said. From one to six months is schizophreniform disorder, and less than one month is brief psychotic disorder. And remember, the onset is counted as the onset of any symptoms, including the prodrome, not just when the psychotic symptoms kick in. A couple bits of trivia. While a lot of the psych disorders tend to disproportionately affect women, with schizophrenia, it's really men that get the short end of the stick. Not only does schizophrenia have a slight male predominance, it also has a reliably earlier onset in men, kind of like I alluded to earlier. 
usually late teens to early 20s in men, and 20s to 30s in women. There is definitely a genetic component in who tends to get schizophrenia. People with schizophrenic family members, and actually also bipolar family members, are more likely to develop it. Now, weirdly enough, marijuana use in your teens is demonstrated to be pretty reliably associated with developing schizophrenia later on. They used to think it worked kind of like substance abuse in the other psych disorders, as in, people who are mentally or emotionally compromised tend to gravitate more towards substance use and abuse. With some recent studies, though, they're starting to think that marijuana may actually be a causal factor in the development of not only schizophrenia, but other psychotic disorders. I'm not sure how strong the evidence is on that one, but that is what the research is currently suggesting, so until then, stay off the reefer, kids. Now, nobody really knows what exactly causes schizophrenia or the rest of the psychotic disorders, but there are a couple of pathophysiologic correlations that we've been using to help guide our treatment. For example, you often see uh, enlarged ventricles on CT and increased dendritic branching on histologic evaluation, but this is more of an interesting fact. I mean, nobody's doing brain biopsies to diagnose these people. A lot of the focus of schizophrenia research has actually been on the neurotransmitter levels and the pathways. You guys remember the neurotransmitter commonly implicated in schizophrenia? While increased dopamine activity in the cerebral cortex has historically been the focus of schizophrenia research, increased serotonergic activity has an increasingly recognized role in its pathogenesis. And for that reason, the treatment for schizophrenia involves dopamine blockade with antipsychotics and to a lesser extent, serotonin blockade. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about antipsychotics in the farm section, but what you need to know now is that the first-line drugs for schizophrenia and the rest of the psychotic disorders are the atypical antipsychotics. Not because they treat negative symptoms better, because that's a myth that's been busted. It's just that they have a lower incidence of significant side effects. Now, regarding prognosis, schizophrenia is considered one of the most debilitating psychiatric disorders by a lot of psychiatrists, but the truth is the prognosis can vary a lot. While for some people, treating schizophrenia is really a damage control game, some do actually become functioning members of society especially if they have strong social support. There's a couple of things that help psychiatrists predict whether or not a patient will do well with treatment. First, the age of onset. The earlier the age, the worse the prognosis, meaning, of course, that schizophrenic men in general tend to do worse. Second, you might think that the floridly psychotic hallucinating schizophrenics are the hardest to treat. But like I mentioned, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia tend to respond to medication, whereas the negative symptoms really don't. Finally, it should really go without saying, but Patients with schizophrenia have a much higher suicide rate than the general population, and this is something you do need to screen for in your schizophrenic patients. Next on the list of assorted schizophrenia spectrum disorders is schizoaffective disorder, and this is one they really try to get you with on step one. Schizoaffective disorder is basically a psychotic disorder that causes the patient to experience mood episodes. So, what's so confusing about that? Well, as it turns out, it's actually not uncommon for major depressive disorder, and especially bipolar disorder, to cause psychosis in and of themselves. But not to worry, I'll make this easy on you. So, since schizoaffective disorder is primarily a psychotic disorder that causes mood episodes, the psychotic episodes define when the mood episodes occur. That is to say, the mood episodes must overlap with the psychotic episodes, but the psychotic episodes can occur independently of the mood episodes. So what do you expect the overlap pattern of a mood disorder with psychosis to look like? Mood disorders only have psychosis as a part of the mood episode generally either at the highest high or the lowest low. To further distinguish between the two, there is a caveat that states that schizoaffective disorder must have at least a two-week period of psychosis during which there is no mood disorder. So why do we care? Because when it comes to treatment, schizoaffective disorder is treated primarily as a psychotic disorder, whereas, in general, mood disorders will lose the psychotic aspect if you just treat the mood disorder. Now, things get a little bit more complicated when it comes to bipolar 1, because, as you'll see, full manic patients are actually psychotic a huge percentage of the time. Finally, there is one other instance of mood and psychotic symptoms I want to address, and that's bereavement. The death of a loved one is such an emotionally traumatic experience that it's not uncommon for the bereaved person to hallucinate just a little. As in, hear their dead relative's voice, see their dead relative floating above their bed in the night, whatnot. If it's just hallucinations and it only has to do with the relative, then it falls under the category of bereavement, which makes it normal. That means you don't treat it either as a mood disorder or a psychotic disorder. Therapy will usually do the trick. Delusional disorder is a pretty weak sauce psychiatric disorder compared to the heavy hitters like schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders. And I'll give you three guesses as to what it entails. Tough one, I know. Basically, the only psychotic symptom here is delusion, and it has to be present for more than a month. There usually isn't any loss of function outside the, you know, social and occupational issues that arise from the delusion itself. Finally, this is a pretty low yield fact. Delusions can be shared if two people are very close, a phenomenon with the adorably French name of folie à deux. 
Keep in mind, there used to be a stipulation in the DSM-4 that delusional disorder had to include only non-bizarre delusions. There used to be a pretty arbitrary distinction between bizarre and non-bizarre that no longer actually exists in the DSM-5, so that's no longer a deciding factor in this diagnosis. That's just for you old-timers who remembered the DSM-4 guidelines. And finally, you know you can't talk about the schizophrenia spectrum disorders without giving a nod to the family of personality disorders known as the Cluster A personality disorders. And there's three branches to this side of the psychotic family tree. You have your paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. <laughs> hey, remember how you were just saying you wanted more schizo words to remember? Looks like your wish came true! Paranoid PD embraces the paranoid ideation of the psychotic disorders, being mistrustful to a fault and assuming the worst intentions of everyone. Schizoid PD captures the negative symptoms rather than the psychotic symptoms, with decreased emotional depth, apathy, and a marked lack of desire for human relationships. Schizoid the android, I call him. Anyway, schizotypal PD embodies disorganization through odd, slightly bizarre thought processes and evidence of mild behavioral disorganization like poor hygiene, wearing unusual garments like paper bags as hats, and a complete inability to relate to other people. Now, some schizotypals are like the schizoids and couldn't care less about interpersonal relationships, but in some of them, this actually causes a lot of anxiety and feelings of estrangement. And strange they are, but it falls just short of the marked disturbances in experiencing reality that buy you the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And on that note, the most you're going to be asked to do with these on step one is to identify them. And given the confusingly similar names and weird behavior patterns, you have to try not to fall into the trap of calling them all schizophrenia. The important thing to remember about these is that while they do share a genetic association with schizophrenia, they're not actually true psychotic disorders and are not characterized by hallucinations or delusions. Now, when it comes to schizoid PD, this one's easy. Since negative symptoms on their own are never enough to qualify for schizophrenia, people don't usually confuse this. Schizoid might actually look like autism on the surface, but with autism, you'll usually see other things like repetitive movements and intellectual disabilities that you don't actually see with schizoid. With schizotypal and paranoid PD, the odd beliefs fall subjectively short of the bizarreness and implausibility of the delusions that you see in schizophrenia. But I think you're playing a losing game if you're trying to rationalize to yourself whether the paranoia or the magical thinking actually qualifies as a delusion or not. At the end of the day, that's actually a subjective judgment that takes a trained psychiatrist to tease out. In my opinion, the key to distinguishing paranoid PD and schizotypal PD from schizophrenia is that they're not psychiatric disorders at all, but rather personality disorders. Namely, bizarre, maladaptive personality traits that exist for most, if not all, of their lives. I'll give you an example. A vignette describing a patient with paranoid or schizotypal PD will usually mention that his friends say that he's always been like this. Whereas, like I mentioned, schizophrenia will more often present with an acute onset in the 20s or 30s with episodic psychosis. Alright everybody, that's a lot to know about the psychotic disorder, so I think we better take a time out for a flash quiz. If a person presents with two months of psychotic symptoms followed by a year of anxiety and social isolation, what kind of psychotic disorder does he or she have? Go ahead and pause the video if you need some time to think. So the point of the question was to see who was listening to me and counted the prodrome as part of the duration. While some of you might have jumped the gun and thought schizophreniform, because the florid psychotic symptoms lasted for two months, note that the prodrome of the patient acting different has lasted for almost a year, well above the six-month time requirement for schizophrenia. And that wraps it up for these. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up down below if you liked the video, and as always, comments are more than welcome. Arjun Iyer, signing out.